Hello, my friends. It's Chris Biffle, Coach B, broadcasting live on December 2nd, 2013. This is the Big Enchilada Show. We are talking about 13 weeks of Whole Brain Teaching Wondrous Power Tricks. Program 569. And tonight, we're going to review... Review. We're going to review 13 weeks in one hour, and we're going to throw in a zingy bonus for you, the seven big truths about teaching, never before revealed. Deb Weigel's online, Nancy uh, Stoltenberg, Andre Desch, so many wonderful people. Pay attention to the names in red. Those are the ones who have a lot of whole brain teaching experience. Also tonight, we are going to play You Bet Your Wibby. Who's excited about You Bet Your Wibby, even if you don't know what You Bet Your Wibby is? Can I get some texted excitement from my friends out there in digital land? Oh, they're excited. Lots of exclamation points flying across the screen. You Bet Your Wibby coming tonight. Now here's a little commercial for you. This would be a nice Christmas present if you've got some harried colleagues. Buy them a copy of Whole Brain Teaching for Challenging Kids. It's full of funtricity. Also tonight, a wondrous announcement, which you may not have heard. It's coming at the end of the program. A little bit more about us. We're Whole Brain Teaching. We've got over 100,000 registered members, 4 million views on YouTube. 10 million pages downloaded. We are one of the world's most popular education websites. And are we cooking on Facebook? Oh, my friends. You know what? We've got 60,000 likes now, and we're getting them at, a, at hundreds a day. We're going to be passing Beyonce any time now. Some of you may want to use the webcast for professional development. Here's Biffy Bluebird. Biffy, how you doing? I'm doing fine, coach. How do we get a professional development certificate? Well, Smarty Wonder be good to have you. Thanks, coach. Glad to be here. Easy breezy lemon squeezy. Details are at the end of this program if you want a professional development certificate or copies of the slides. All right, I'm starting right off the bat with the zingy bonus. I know that's going to get some of you too excited. As always, I urge you to keep pillows around your chairs because I don't want you fainting from delirious wonderment. The seven big truths of teaching, I'm going to give them to you. Here are, here's the first one. Took me 43 years to figure this out. Here's the first big truth. Pay attention, my friends. Teaching is not telling. That's a shocker. We keep telling kids what to do because they don't do what we tell them to do. If teaching was telling, then we'd only have to tell them a few times. Jeff Battle, I'm sure you agree with me that teaching is not telling which is weird. It's so weird because we think teaching is telling. And so we're telling them and telling them and telling them and telling them. If teaching was truly telling, we wouldn't have any problems. We just tell them what to do and tell them how to write and tell them how to behave. So is everybody shocked out there at this first great truth? It took me 42 and a half years. Yeah, Deb Weigel says, yeah, our solution when kids don't understand is be louder and slower. Like, that's really going to make it work. Here's the second big truth. The obvious question is, what is teaching? Teaching is creating fun rehearsals. The more we rehearse anything, the deeper it's buried in our long-term memory. The more fun the rehearsal 
the more likely we are to keep rehearsing. That's what you're supposed to be doing. Rehearse and practice, rehearse and practice. Take a simple case. You're having problems getting kids to open their books quickly. Oh, why are you having that problem? You've told them to be quick. Why don't you rehearse quickness? You say page 34. They say page 34, page 34, page 34, and woo, they're celebrating when they get there. And you know what? Teacher in South Dakota says we didn't rehearse ecological succession enough. And Andre Desch is right. Rehearsing grows dendrites. And dendrites are good things to grow. I have them in my garden right next to the potatoes and the turnips. Mmm, a yummy fresh dendrite. Now, here is my third big truth. Here it comes. Some of you have heard this before. The longer we talk, the more kids we lose. Listening to a lesson is one of the least effective ways to learn. We learn best when we're seeing, doing, speaking, feeling, and hearing. Of all these modes, feeling is the most important. When you tell your colleagues the kids don't care, you're telling them their emotions are not involved. Even if kids have multiple intelligences, and friends, listen to this, it remains to be proven that they have multiple intelligences. They should be taught using all the brain's learning areas, not just the one the child favors. I know that's revolutionary, but we don't mind being revolutionary once in a while. I hear a lot about multiple intelligences. It's the flavor of the year as I go around the country, and it's all wrong, my friends. First of all, we don't know for sure that kids have multiple intelligences. They're figuring out new multiple intelligences. So we're supposed to teach to a kid the way it's easiest for them to learn. That would be like a basketball coach saying, you know what, my friend, it's easiest for you to dribble with your right hand. Just keep on dribbling right-handed. We need to teach kids in every way the brain can learn. Can you dig that? Has anybody felt a little uneasy about this multiple intelligence thing? I mean, if there's five of them, then you've got to construct five different lessons? Well, what's the motor kid doing when the visual kid is getting his visual lesson? Yeah. I got some people out there that are digging this problem with multiple intelligences, but that's, remember, don't talk so long. Here is my next big truth. We must reward much more for improvement than ability. Our role model should be the kids who improve the most, not those who know the most. Rewarding for ability discourages those with the least ability and encourages those with the most ability to loaf. That's revolutionary, too, now that I think about it. Because what are we doing in school? Uh, you get an A because you know the most. You just came up from Cuernavaca, and you're starting to learn English at an amazing rate, but my friend, you still need improvement. We need to have assemblies twice a year when the kids who have improved the most are held up to riotous applause. That's a new one. And the weird thing is, I never have had a teacher disagree with it. How do you reward for improvement? It's the super improver wall. Which we'll talk about tonight along with 30 other things. Here's a big new truth. When we teach our kids like champion practice, we'll be in teaching heaven. The characteristics of championship practice are well understood. Four hours per day, expert feedback, and complex skills broken into micro skills that are repeated to perfection. How do I know this is true? Kids write poorly because they've had too few rehearsals of micro writing skills. Think about this, my friends. Think about just writing. 
let's say you took a kindergarten kid and only 10 minutes a week you taught them how to play tennis. 10 minutes a week until they got to be a senior. 10 minutes a week, that's all. You taught this kid how to play tennis for 12 years, 10 minutes a week. By the time they're a senior, they would be a good writer. I'm taking off the glasses now, my friend. You know this is an exciting point. We are giving our kids more than 10 minutes of practice of writing a week. And by the time they get to be seniors, they still can't write. What's wrong with that? The problem is we're not taking writing and breaking it into small skills. We still have kids in, in high school whose writing is sloppy. They haven't even mastered a kindergarten neatness. Oh, we'll come back with some programs on writing one of these days. Could I get an amen, a hallelujah, and I'm with you, coach, out there in digital land? And please, don't be disturbed if I occasionally scratch my face, which the big shot anchors on television never do, but I have an abnormally itchy face. Here is the next one. Check it out. It takes 10,000 hours of championship practice to become expert at a complex skill like ice skating, chess playing, doctoring, or teaching. That number, 10,000 hours, keeps coming up over and over again in the research on what it takes to be a champion. Well, here's the deal. If you spend 10 years in teaching, you'll put in 10,000 hours in the classroom. So there's no way of avoiding the 10,000 hours. The question is, what are you going to do with it? Do you want to end up envying great instructors or being one? That's the question. How are you going to spend your 10,000 hours? Here's the cop-out. We say, oh, she was just born to be a great teacher. She's just got natural ability and I don't. You know what? Follow that person home at night. Listen to how they talk to themselves day after day after day. Look at the research they're doing. Look at the lesson plans they're creating. Look at the number of times they give a lesson and it doesn't work and they try again and they try again and they try again. That's what it takes to be a champion. Not natural ability. It's how many times you're going to get up off the ice and try again. Are you a champion, recoverer, from falling. Yes, my friends, those are the seven big truths. Now, let's play You Bet Your Wibby. You need a piece of paper. You need to keep score. You need to see how much you know about whole brain teaching. Here we go. Week one. Week one, we had the attention getters. Class, yes. Class, yes, boom. Core knowledge, yes. And you get four points if you taught a teacher one or more of the attention getters. The class, yes, is you say class, they say yes. You say class, boom. And they say, class, boom, and fold their hands. So you say, class, boom. They say, yes, boom. That's two points if you're using that. If you're using a core knowledge call out, like, what's nine times seven? They say, nine times seven is 63. If you're using those, you get three points. And if you taught someone else about all this stuff, my friends, you can give yourself Four points. So 10 points possible here. Let me see your scores rolling down the screen. Who's got 10 out of 10? Are you doing all of them? All right. Here's our next big one. Mirrors. There's three kinds of mirrors. We covered these in week two. 
Here's how the mirrors work. If I say mirror words, the kids say mirror words, and they say my words and they make my gestures. If you're doing that, you're a rookie, you get one point. If you say silent mirrors, you say silent mirrors, mm, and then you talk and make gestures, but they just make your gestures. You're locking their brains into your brain. If you say magic mirrors, you put your hands behind your back. They say magic mirrors. Ooh. Talk slowly. Let them invent the gestures. Let's look at your score sheet here. One point if you're using mirror words. Two points if you're using silent mirror. Three points for magic mirror. And if you taught these to another teacher you get for another 10 possible. So you're up to 20 now. Let's see your scores flow down the screen. 20 possible, where are you? Jeff Battles at 16, Blizzard's at 17. Wolf Alicious, my good friend, is at 17. B. Marvin's at nine. Sister Mary's at 14. Oh, yeah. Let those numbers flow down the screen. All right, my friends. Go back and look at week two mirrors. Blizzard, can you occasionally put on the webcast number? Look up what mirror, the mirror webcast is. Here's why we should be using mirrors, my friend. Check it out. When you're using mirrors, your premotor cortex, your motor cortex, your visual cortex, and your cerebellum are all engaged. It's how we get 100% student engagement. Let's look at our next webcast from week three, classroom rules. Let's just look very quickly at what those classroom rules are. Rule one, follow directions quickly. Rule two, raise your hand for permission to speak. Rule three, raise your hand for permission to leave your seat. Rule four, make smart choices. And rule five, keep your dear teacher happy. Let's just check with my online friends. Who's using the five rules out there in digital land? Oh, Chrissy says she uses them almost every day. Court uses them. Jill is always using them. Well, you must be racking up some points on the rules. Let's score a few points here, my friends. If you're reviewing the rules every day and you're doing the review, give yourself a point. If a kid is leading the review, that's even better, two points. If you're using rules callouts, <coughs> I'll explain that in a second, that's three. And if you taught these rules to another teacher, that's four. Here's a rule call out. So a kid forgets to raise their hand for permission to speak. You say two. And everyone else says, raise your hand for permission to speak. That is a rule call out. Who's using those rule call outs? How many points you got? My friends, you could have 30 points. Let's see how you're doing. <coughs> Don't be shy. If you're a rookie, the worst thing to be is be shy. Just put it out there. How many points you got? 57, I think it's good to speak in complete sentences. Jeff Battle, shame on you for counting wrong. You're up to 10 points a, a whack, my friend, so this is 30 points.
All right. Let's look at week four. Rules implementation. If you are teaching your kids to follow directions quickly, wonderful. If your kids can follow rules one to four even better, and if they've mastered all five rules, you're in teaching heaven. Give yourself four points if you've taught another teacher how to implement the rules. Let's just talk about implementation of rule one, follow directions quickly. Practice following directions quickly with what we call the three P. So if you say lines, they say lines, 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 they line up quickly and when they're in line they celebrate, woo. If you say seats, they say seats, seats, seats and they take their seat and sit down and celebrate, woo. Don't teach them how to line up or sit down or open their books when it's really time to do those things. That's the rehearsals we're talking about. Rehearse a procedure. That's what teaching is. It isn't telling them to be fast. It's giving them practice at being fast. Who is using the three-peat? I want to know. Who's using the three-peat? You say it, they say it three times and do it quickly. And yes, there's a Facebook page for Kinder. I'm drinking to all my Kinder friends out there. Names in red, if you don't mind, put your email address up there and tell people what grade you teach if you'd like to help out and answer some emails. All right, my friends, we're already, we've covered about 12 or 15 different techniques. We're up to week four. Here's week five that teach OK. Let me show you a diagram of the teach OK. Look here. The red, the red square is the teacher. The purple square is the student. You start by saying class. They say yes. Speak briefly, then clap twice and say teach, and they say okay. This right here is the teach okay. Speak briefly, clap twice and say teach, they say okay, and they teach each other. And then you call them back. That's the key to our method, the teach okay. And it's the hardest thing to master. It's hard to master the teach okay because we love to talk. But remember one of the great truths of teaching. The longer we talk, the more kids we lose. Now, how long should you talk? We say when you're really good, you talk for two sentences and do a teach okay. Two sentences and do a teach okay. You'd be amazed how much material you can cover systematically if you'll take out all the chaff and the verbiage. All right, you're up to 50 points possible here in week five. How many points are you giving yourself? Where are you at? Let's have those numbers flow down the screen. 48 says Loftus. Nancy has 50. Ambler, if you do the teach okay, you've mastered our hardest trick. Here are the five points again, my friend. I'd be happy to show them to you. Jill, just tell them in advance who the partners are. Court has 44. Page art, keep adding them up. You guys are doing fantastic. Let's look at some more whole brain teaching techniques. The scoreboard. Here's a picture of the scoreboard right there. This is the way we prefer it labeled now. Deb Weigel is not crazy about it, but we're sticking with it. If you don't like baby school, put not best effort. And here's a new tweak, my friends. 
When kids are on task, they do a mighty oh yeah, oh yeah. But if you're using the baby school, they do this. Wham! More fun. Now, the reward is that you're trying to be two grade levels higher than your grade. That's what you're shooting for. So for a fifth grade class, for a third grade class, you'd put fifth grade on one side, baby school on the other. You make marks for positive behavior and marks for negative behavior. And remember, keep the score within three points. It's your option what to put here, but we really encourage you to set the goal as two weeks two grades higher. Teacher versus students is totally doable. So let's look at the scoreboard. If you're making 20 marks a day, you probably feel pretty good about yourself, but that really is rookie level. This is if you're teaching all day long. If you get up to 30 marks a day, you're at the pro level. All-star 40 marks a day. And you're an MVP if you taught another teacher about the scoreboard. Let's just see what the scoreboard scores are. You could have scored from 0 to 10. Give me your scoreboard scores. How are you doing on the scoreboard? How many marks are you making? Apple 3, hang in there. Don't get down on yourself. Jill? That's a problem if you're not using the scoreboard because you're not adjusting behavior. You see the point. About 10 an hour is, is, is okay. Here's the deal. How many times do you say, stop that, don't do that, pay attention, keep your hands to yourself, all that kind of stuff? Way more than 40 times a day. Count them up. Instead of just addressing one kid, you say, oh, some of my friends are really on task. Mighty, oh, yeah. Oh, that was a little slow. Mighty grown. Use the scoreboard. It turns the class into a game. And here's what they're going to say. What do we get for winning? You've got an answer all prepared. You say, you get the same thing for winning at the scoreboard that you do when you win a video game. The fun of playing and being a winner. Do not give away junk for winning at the scoreboard. It's a long year. Yes, my friends. All right, here's our next one. Super improver. A lot of people, a lot of people love the super improver. So if you're using the Super Improver Wall, let's just hear some praise for how the Super Improver Wall is working for you. Here's a picture of it. This is what the Super Improver Wall looks like. Who's using it? Who loves it? So... You're a rookie if you're giving lots of praise and few stars. You're a pro if you started to set individual improver goals. You're an all-star if you've used this super improver odyssey with Mysterion. And one of my friends is going to... Blizzard points out that all the details in the super improver wall are in webcast 568. The whole idea of super improver is... When you see a kid improving at anything, you praise him, praise him, praise him. Then you give him a star. Here's the diagram. You give him a star. So there would be stars on this board. And then when they get 10 stars, you change their color. Reward for improvement, not ability. Here is the upper grade version. 
You play one period against another. Super improvers is one of our most revolutionary techniques. It's totally flexible. You can use it for writing or lining up or paying attention. Whatever you want improvement on. And you know what? You want kids to improve on everything. The team version page art. You're going one period against another. You pick out five or six kids who are your leaders. And when you see them improving, you give the period a star. Ten stars changes the color. Now, week eight. Okay, tell me how many points you got total here. We're, we should have, we have a maximum of 70 points. Who's really cranking and who wishes they were cranking? 70 points possible and you bet your Wibby. This is seven solid weeks. B Ambler, keep on wishing. Tall man, you're at 55. Tall man, have you improved over the weeks? Sarah Metter, welcome online. Come on, Sarah. Marsh? That's all right. You can always go back and watch the webcasts. Nancy, how did Mysterion work? All right, practice cards. Here's what practice cards look like. You put up the kids' names on the wall, and when you see them breaking a rule, you put the rule number in the practice card, and then they practice the rule gesture for two minutes at recess. Now, you might say, Coach, you're going fast. I'm covering 13 weeks, my friend, and telling you where the webcasts are. You're getting the big picture tonight. Practice cards, we say in general, you should wait till after Christmas. We want a system that's like a video game. So we start at the scoreboard, then we go super improvers, then we go practice cards, and each level adds the previous levels. All right, how are we doing? You could have 90 points. No, you could have 80 points by now because week eight didn't count. What's everybody's total score who's able to add quickly? I'll put it back up on the screen for you. If you're all ready to green card, something's wrong, my friends, with your practice card system. All right, a few more weeks to go, but they're goodies. The guff counter. Here's what the guff counter looks like. You add it to your scoreboard. When kids give you guff, they give you back talk. You use the guff counter to stop the back talk. Here's what you do. You say, Oh, that sounds like guff to me. And the kids say, please stop. Please review that guff counter webcast. 566. Six. If you're tired of back talk, take a look at it. And I use it in college all the time. Would you believe that college kids would back talk their dear philosophy professor? You better believe it. So here's the back talk scoreboard. If you're having a rehearsal of guff, showing what guff looks like, you're a rookie. If you're actually using the guff counter, you're a pro. If you have made it for a guffless week, you are an all-star. 
Who doesn't know about the guff counter but is so intrigued to find out about anything that will stop back talk? Remember, it's webcast 566. We have an answer, I think, for almost every teaching problem. Why? Because we're all teachers. Look at that webcast 566. All right. Week 11, the independence. You use this if you have a rebel click. You turn the rebels against each other. Who's got a rebel click and would love to see the rebels chewing on each other's tail instead of nipping at yours? If you've used the independence, give yourself one. If it's been effective, give yourself two. If you've used it twice, hey, you're an all-star. 100 points possible so far. The independence goes on your scoreboard. Helen Bo, you got rebel clicks in San Diego? Don't. Here, let me, let me just take off my glasses, my friend. Look, we're throwing a lot at you tonight. Go slow. Start with the attention getters. Don't say, I've got a rebel click. I think I'll try this. No. You don't know if you have a rebel click until they survive everything else. It's a long year. Use the system the way it was designed. Unless... It's a big emergency, then maybe you're on your own. But you could post some questions on our forum and we'd help you out. All right. Total points so far 100. Let's look at the screen again. Here's the screen. The rebel click is your colleague's Apple III. Keep that information to yourself. You cannot reform rebellious colleagues. Believe me. Sarah Metter is right. Here's week 11, the bullseye game. You've used the bullseye game. These are for your most challenging kids. And here's what it looks like. You know you have a challenging kid if they've resisted every penalty and they're immune to peer pressure. That's the toughest of the tough kids. Anybody have, anybody use the bullseye game. Here it is again. That's what it looks like. All right, my friends, about 120 points possible, I think. And here's how the levels stack up. Start with the scoreboard. Go to Super Improvers after about two weeks. Wait as long as you can for practice cards and add these others as you need them. Now, what would a timeline look like? Let's say you've got a really sweet class. Remember these all add together. So from day one, you're going to use the scoreboard. About day 10, use super improvers. You've got sweet kids, so you don't need practice cards until January. And keep these other things, guff counter, independence, and bullseye game in your back pocket because you've got sweeties. But my friends, let's say you don't have sweeties. You've got rowdies. Well, you're still starting the scoreboard of the first day. 
you still go to the super improvers on day 10. Early October, you're hitting practice cards, and in November, you got to use the guff counter. Wait till after Christmas for independence and bullseye. That's just an approximation of how things ought to go. Here is a big, huge, super large point. Use a tally sheet. Keep track of what you want to practice. This is how you keep organized. If I was a beginner, I'd put class yes, class boom, and core knowledge on my tally sheet, and that's all I'd work on for a week. Again, we say the system solves virtually every teaching problem if you apply the system and give kids plenty of time to rehearse. You would be amazed at how kids who seem so challenging and so resistant, if you use the scoreboard and use the super improvers and use the teach okay and the mirror words and all the rest of that fun stuff, they end up being some of your best kids. All right, here it is. Where do you rank? Let's hear it. 100 to 110 points, you are a living legend. 0 to 9, you're a bench warmer. Tell us where you're at, my friends. What level did you get to for the 13-week review? We got rookie, we got leader, we got bench warmer, says blue eyes. We got a starter, says Marvin. Rookie says still teaching. Superstar says blizzard. Tamika is a starter. And tall man has moved up to star. Apple three's a phenom. Chrissy's a phenom. Dewey's just a rookie. Nancy's in the Hall of Fame. Hall of Fame, says Jeff Battle. Yes, my friends. That's how we play You Bet Your Wibby. Keep practicing. Keep improving. You're only halfway through the year. Well, here's our friend Ms. Linenthal. Gosh, the big enchilada review sounds great, but how could I get a professional development credit for this broadcast and a copy of these slides? Ms. Linenthal, how's that called? Oh, it's so much better, Coach, but how do I get professional development credit? Ms. Linenthal, this is program 569. And if you want a copy of the whole thing, which summarizes 13 weeks, which is pretty cool, then right here in the PayPal box at wholebrainteaching.com, I'll go there in a second. In the PayPal box, let me bring up a new window here. And I'm going to wholebrainteaching.com. Here I am. Here's the PayPal box. You put $5.69 in there. I will send you a copy of all the slides and a professional development certificate. How could you resist that? All right, my dear friends, here is the amazing announcement. We are going to have, yes, the big announcement coming in the new year, WBT Parenting. Go to that Facebook page and like it. Tell your kids' parents to like it. Once we get a 1,000 likes, and we've got about 950, we will start posting articles about whole brain parenting. And we need whole brain parenting especially with the way kids are turning out in whole brain classrooms. Please like that page. Now, what is coming in January? I'll tell you, a whole new program, a new sequence. This has been 13 weeks on classroom management. And we haven't even picked out 
some of our biggest, most powerful strategies yet. We're going to have a new series in the new year, and I know you're going to love this title. Reforming Resistant Learners. Reforming Resistant Learners. Who's excited about a new series just focused on resistant learners? I'm drinking while you're excited. Let's just spend a bunch of weeks on talking about kids who resist learning. What can we do for them? Quite a lot, it turns out, my friends. I'm seeing excitement out there. All right, so that's coming in January. Please tell your parents to like the Facebook page. Let's go to that Facebook page right now. I'm going there. Nobody can stop me. Give me a second. We need a thousand likes on whole brain teaching parenting. Here it is. Right now, we've got 958. Get me 42 more, and I'll start posting articles on the Facebook page. It's going to be Facebook, 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 little lessons. Here's the link again. Write it down. All right, my dear friends, that was the big enchilada. We've had 13 weeks of fun, and I, I can tell that people are just excited all across the country about whole brain teaching. So before we go, let the names flow down the screen. Where are you from, and what do you teach? Let's see who we're reaching. I know we're reaching Brazil. Talk to me, my friends. Where are you from? What do you teach? Let those names flow down the screen. Wichita, Pittsburgh, Florida, Covina, New Jersey, Tennessee, Canton, North Carolina, and Louisiana, Wilson, Kansas, Palmdale, California, Arizona, Pennsylvania, White Lake, Michigan, Arizona, Texas even, Nashville, Southern Oregon, Margate, Ontario, Ontario, Canada, I'm guessing. Kindergarten, South Carolina. Well, my friends, this is Coach B signing off for the holidays. Watch those free webcasts. Learn some more about whole brain teaching. And my friends, do please pray for my family. We are in extreme need of prayer. Keep those prayers coming, my friends. Power to the teachers, Coach B, signing off. See you next time.